morning. Good morning. Good morning. Happy, happy New Year to all of you. And happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath, indeed. Alisa, Barbara, and I are just delighted to be with you this morning. Uh, we, of course, wish you all a very blessed Sabbath. We're pleased that you have decided to join us virtually uh, to study God's Word through the Sabbath School lesson. Now, before we start, Barbara, will, will you invoke the presence of God in our yes, study today? Yes, I would love to. Thank you. Our dear Father in heaven, it's, we're so excited to have another Sabbath school lesson with you. And Lord, this book of Hebrews is so important. It's all about you. Amen. From the beginning to the end, it encompasses the New Testament and the Old Testament, Lord. Amen. And so as we share this word today, we pray that you will be glorified in every way, that your words will ring clear in the ears of the hearers, that your heart, your spirit will open hearts, and that lives will be transformed because of this study today. So Lord, be with us, be with each of us as speakers, and just bless this lesson beyond belief. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, thank you so much, Barbara. The memory text this morning, and by the way, before we do that, this week's Sabbath School lesson is titled, The Message of Hebrews. In, in, in a sense, we really are going to do a pre-summary to the book of Hebrews today, and as we study the lesson. The memory text is found in Hebrews chapters, uh, chapter 8, verses 1, and what an incredible introduction to the book of Hebrews. It says, this is the main point of the things we are saying. It says, we have such a high priest, we seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. So, you know, as we look at the, at the memory verse, it's pretty, pretty simple. Jesus Christ is our high priest, and he is not an ordinary high priest, such as those in the Aaronic priesthood. Jesus Christ serves next to the throne of God. Our high priest is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is a place of honor, but it is also a place of authority next to the king of the universe. As a brief overview of this week's Sabbath School lesson, I'm going to um, uh, really uh, speak a little bit about Hebrews. Um, early New Testament Christians read Hebrews as a letter from the Apostle Paul. However, the writer of the book of Hebrews appears to be anonymous. The epistle does not say who the author is. The point of view developed and expressed in the epistle of Hebrews is characteristically and uniquely that of the Apostle Paul, as expressed in the letter to Rome, or the Romans, Galatians, and these other letters. However, the style of writing is definitely not Paul's. This suggests that the, the possibility that the content of the epistle may have come from the Apostle Paul himself, guided by the Holy Spirit, but that the actual writing or editing was done by a trusted assistant and there is direct supervision, such as Luke, maybe Timothy, or someone else. The epistle of Hebrews constitutes an enlightened and enlightening appeal, an appeal to the church, not only to Christian Jews of the first century, but to all human beings of all time, you and I, to turn their eyes heavenward and to enter fully into the gracious provisions made for all of us in the perfect and perpetual ministry of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. In the epistle of Hebrews, Jesus is the centerpiece. Jesus is described as the ruler of the universe enthroned at God's right hand. Therefore, in chapters 1 and chapter 12 of Hebrews, the angels celebrate Jesus. They worship him and they serve him. Jesus has won the right to rule because he has ensured the destruction of the devil through his own death on the cross. Hebrews chapter 2 addresses that very factor. 
But Jesus is also described as the exalted high priest, sinless and perfectly holy. He lives forever to minister in our behalf in the heavenly sanctuary. And Hebrews chapter 7, verses 26 to chapter 8, verses 5, talks about that. He has won the right to be our high priest because he offered himself as a perfect, once-for-all sacrifice, effective forever, for everyone and forevermore, as we read in Hebrews chapter 10. Jesus has mediated a new covenant between God and his people that will stand forever. And uh, chapter 8 of Hebrews addresses just that. And um, you see, as, as the author of this quarter's lesson so eloquently stated, in the person of Jesus, three dimensions of the story of redemption intersect. The first of these dimensions is the personal dimension. Perhaps you feel tired or disappointed, demoralized of the reproaches and hardships of a Christian life. The epistle of Hebrews tells us that Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. We need to look to Jesus who also suffered at the ends of sinners as the source of our faith. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, um, Paul writes, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and they sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. The second dimension is the corporate dimension, the collective dimension, the church's dimension. As we travel together toward God's promised land, Jesus is the new Joshua. We need to follow his lead daily. And so Hebrews chapters 3, 4, 11, and 12 are dedicated to, to really get us to um, follow Jesus, the new Joshua. The third dimension is the universal dimension. Jesus is the new Adam, the son of man, in whom God's purpose for humanity are fulfilled. And so in Hebrews chapters 2, verses 9 to 11, we read... But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death crowned with honor and glory, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons and daughters to glory to make the caption of their salvation perfect, through sufferings. Verse 11, for both he who sanctifies and those who are both being sanctified are all of one, for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. So, the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews to strengthen your faith and my faith amid the many trials we experience every day. He reminds us that the promises of God will be fulfilled through Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of the Father and who will soon take us home. In the meantime, Jesus is mediating the Father's blessings for you and for me. Let's hold fast to our faith until the very end. See, the Sabbath school lesson lessons these quarters aim to capture the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of God's love. This week's lesson emphasizes primarily two things. The first of these is Christ is our king. And the second is that Christ is our mediator. Elisa, mm -hmm. tell us about Jesus as our king. Great, thank you. Jesus is our king uh, is, is Sunday's lesson. And as we go into this, um, the central theme of Hebrews is Jesus, the sovereign of all creation who conquered sin 
defeated Satan, and is now seated at the right hand of God the Father, continually working on behalf of his people. My Bible has an introductory for the book of Hebrews that summarizes the context of this letter and its main theme well. It says, Many Jewish believers, having stepped out of Judaism into Christianity, want to reverse their course in order to escape persecution by their countrymen. The writer of Hebrews exhorts them to go on to perfection. His appeal is based on the superiority of Christ over the Judaic system. Christ is better than the angels, for they worship him. He is better than Moses, for he created him. He is better than the Aaronic priesthood, for his sacrifice was once for all time. He is better than the law, for he mediates a better covenant. In short, there is more to be gained in Christ than to be lost in Judaism. Pressing on in Christ produces tested faith, self-discipline, and a visible love seen in good works. Surely this is true for us living in the last days as it was for those early Christians. Christ and only Christ is qualified to be our king and ruler. And a great mystery is that king and ruler is also called our brother. In Hebrews 4.15, we read that he sympathizes with our weakness because he was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. Christ is much more than a ruler and king as we understand those positions from an earthly perspective. So let's study together what Hebrews says about Jesus our king. We're going to read through Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 14, but we'll break that into sections to summarize key points in each. So starting with verses 1 through 4, we read about Jesus' rulership. And it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. So in summary here, we learn Jesus was appointed and sent to us by God the Father. There is no higher authority that can perform this. We also learn that Jesus is heir and creator of all things. We also learn that Jesus is the brightness and express image of God the Father, separate beings but one in purpose. Jesus' word upholds and sustains all things. It is through his power we have life. We also learn that Jesus purged our sins. The word purged expresses completely cleansed and removed. These sins cannot come back unless we, by our choice, bring them back by turning away from Christ. Jesus sits in heaven at the right hand of God the Father, this is a position of authority and honor, ruling with God the Father. And then we learn Jesus is better than the angels. He is the Son, and by inheritance has obtained a better name than they. This is a key point we don't want to miss. In the first chapter of Hebrew, the writer clearly outlines the difference in position between Jesus and the angels a point which Satan, who is a created being and was the highest of the angels in heaven, tried to blur and eliminate by desiring the position of the Son, rebelling against God, and overthrowing the rulership of earth through Adam's sin. However, it was and is impossible for Satan to succeed. That right and authority of rulership conferred from the Father belongs to Christ and Christ alone. In verses 5 through 12, we will discuss Jesus' enthronement ceremony in heaven. The ceremony contains three key parts and provide evidence that Jesus is the fulfillment of these messianic prophecies. In verse 5, 
it, we read, for to which of the angels did he ever say, you are my son, today I have begotten you, and again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. In summary, Jesus is installed as the royal son. In verses 6 to 8, we read, But when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire? But to the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. In summary here, God introduces Jesus to the heavenly court, who worship him while the Father proclaims the eternal creatorship and rule of the Son. In verses 8 to 12, we read, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is a scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God, your God, has, a, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth. And the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. And they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will fold them up, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not fail. In summary, God enthrones the Son, conferring power over the earth to Jesus. And then in verse 3, 13 and 14, we conclude with making a clear distinction between Christ, the son of inheritance, and the angels who are created beings. Verse 13 and 14 read, But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? In summary, Jesus is superior to the angels and is ruler of all. The angels serve God by ministering to us, carrying out God's will for us. We see examples of this in the Bible. For instance, an angel brought food and comfort to Elijah after he fled from the wrath of Jezebel. While the angels hold an important position in God's service, they can never take the place of the Son. The early Christians, b Christian believers that came from Judaism would have known these messianic prophecies well and were looking for the Messiah that would fulfill God's promise to David that your house and your kingdom shall be established forever before you. Your throne will be established forever. You can read that in 2 Samuel 7:16. In Hebrews, the writer confirms that Jesus is the fulfillment of these promises, and, and you can read about that in Hebrews 3, 1, uh, which states that the, only, on, the one they had been waiting for is, is, that, is that Messiah. So based on this evidence, Paul implores these believers to not lose hope and turn away because of the difficulties they face. Instead, he encourages them to press on because Jesus has overcome Satan and can supply help for any need they have. So I'll hand it over to Barb for Monday. <clears throat> They're talking about Jesus as our mediator. And we're going to really be looking at Jesus as our mediator in the Old Testament. <clears throat> One of the interesting concepts of the Old Testament is the promised Davidic king would represent the nation of God. So we want to start first looking at, um, at how God felt about the, the Jewish nation. And we're going to look at when, the time when Moses goes in before Pharaoh and what God has to say to Pharaoh. So let's look at Exodus 4, 22 through 23. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord, so he's giving him God's words. He's giving Moses God's words. Israel is my son, my firstborn. 
So that's how God felt about the children of Israel. They were his children. So I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. And that we see as we look at the story of Moses and the children of Israel leaving, that, that actually did happen. Then we move on, secondly, and see that God makes a covenant with David. And we're going to look at that in 2 Samuel 7, 12 through 14. When your days are filled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you. You will come from your body and will establish a kingdom. He shall build a house in my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, he shall be my son. However, if he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with a rod of men and with blows or stripes, as some versions say, of the sons of men. So God makes a covenant with, with King David. And the temple was built, and it was magnificent. And God reigned in that temple for many years. Then we'll go on to see in Deuteronomy, you shall not all do as we are here today, every man doing whatever is right in his own eyes. For as for yet, you have not come to the rest and the inheritance which the Lord is giving you, but when you cross the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you, he gives you rest from your enemies round about so that you will dwell in safety. And God keeps his promises. In Second Samuel 7, 9, we see, I have been with you wherever you have gone and have cut your enemies before you and have made you a great name like the name of great men who are on earth. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more, nor shall the sons of wickedness oppress them any more. Since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel and have caused you to rest from your enemies, also the Lord tells you that he will make you a house. And so we see that God continues mediating and keeping his promises for the Israelites. And so um, I want to read to Psalms 13, 2, 1 through 5, and 11 through 14. Lord, remember David, all his afflictions, how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. Surely I will not go into the chamber of my house or the comfort of my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids until I have find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. The Lord has sworn in truth to David. He will not turn from it. I will set upon your throne the fruit of your body. If your sons keep my commandments and my testimony, which I will teach them, their son shall sit upon the throne forever. For the Lord has chosen Zion, and he has desired it to be the dwelling place. This is my resting place forever. I will dwell here as I have desired it. So we see God here working with David, and David understanding that God had a plan for Israel, and it was to be the, the God, the mediator, for them throughout time. And we see this, um, these promises fulfilled throughout the, the, the history of the children of Israel. So Israel was God's son, and God would give the Israelites a place where they would rest from their enemies. God also would choose a place among them where his name would dwell. And so we see that throughout. However, as we know and from studying from past quarters, the Israelites did not always keep their part of the covenant. And we see that Israel had a number of good kings, but it also had a number of very evil kings who drew people away from the Lord. And so 
One of a very good example in the Old Testament that we see where sin is a problem within, and it's a story that I, I like um, to think about when we, when, we, when we teach this, is the story in the sin of Achan. And if you remember the story of Joshua, he sent men from Jericho to Ai, which was beside Beth Avon in the east side of Bethel and spoke to them saying go up and spy out the country so the men went up and they went up and there were 3,000 of them and AI literally decimated them they took them down and so this really upset Joshua and if we pick it up in in verse 6 Joshua tore his clothes and fell on his face before the ark of the Lord until evening. He and the elders of Israel, they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to deliver them into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Oh, what we had been content and dwell on the other side of Jordan. O Lord, what say I when Israel turns its back on to its enemies for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear it and surround us and cut off our name from the earth then what will you do for your great name and so we see this Joshua literally was laying on the ground on his face and we find out why this happened God says in verse 11 Israel has sinned they have condressed con- transgressed my covenant which I commanded them for they have even taken some of the accursed things and have both stolen and deceived that they also put their among their own stuff so what they had done Achan had done is he had taken um, things that didn't belong to him and so it brought destruction upon his sin his specific sin but brought destruction into the whole camp And so finally God tells him to get up, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow because thus says the Lord, there is an accursed thing in the midst of Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you take this accursed thing from you. So we see that sin in the camp is a problem that allows God not to be able to work as he wants to for us. So I just wanted to read to you something from the SDI SDI Bible commentary to wrap up my time here. Shrouded in the pillar of cloud, the world's redeemer held communion with Israel. Not, let us not say then that they had not Christ. When the people thirsted in the wilderness, he gave them up to their murmuring complaint. Christ was to them what he was to us, a savior full of tender compassion the mediator between them and God, after we have done our part to cleanse the soul temple from the defilement of sin, Christ's blood avails to us as it did to the ancient. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you, Elisa. Wonderful to know that Jesus is our king and is the ruler of this earth engaged to fight the devil with us. And it's wonderful to know that he's not only the king, but he's our mediator. Wow, wonderful stuff. All right, Tuesday's lesson is... the one victor that gets in the way of that. Yes, exactly. We are the ones who are causing the problems. You better believe it. (laughs) So, the Tuesday's lesson is a... It's really about Jesus. And Jesus is our champion. And um, I'm going to develop this lesson... um, And I'm I'm going to use a couple of thoughts that are on Tuesday's lesson to develop it. So um, let's look at Israel. Uh, You know, Barbara has brought it up, and I think it's only appropriate. During Prophet Samuel's reign, as high priest, the Jewish nation requested a constitutional change, as if that doesn't sound like today. A constitutional change. There was a crisis of leadership that tested the very existence of Israel as a nation. The foundation of Israel's governance was 
divine kingship or theocracy. It was a theocracy. However, in Samuel's time, Israel's demanded a change. They wanted a king so that they could be like all the nations around them. It is how Samuel described it in 1 Samuel chapter 8. We're going to read verses 4, 5, 19, and 20. So here's how Samuel described it. Verse 4. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah. Verse 5. And said to him, Look, you're an oldie. You're an old man. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge like all nations. Verses 19. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, No, we will have a king over us, verse 20, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. As if the Lord didn't do that for them. It is obvious that the Israelites did not realize that to be unlike all the other nations was a special privilege and a blessing. God had separated the Israelites from every other people to make them his own peculiar treasure. Foolishly, they, the elders and the people themselves, they believed that the tribute levied on conquered people would make Israel rich. Disgusted with the greed and lust of priestly leaders, such as the sons of Eli and Samuel's sons, they thought that the solution rested in submitting to the judgment of one king, like all the other nations had. They were ob oblivious of the fact that an earthly king, a sinful human being, would find even more opportunities to, for favoritism and the gratification of selfish desires than they had experience with priests like the sons of Eli and Samuel. It is just a fact that when we depart from the Lord and become ambitious for the gains and honors which this world offers, it is just unfortunate, you know, this happens, and it is just unfortunate to see Christians constantly seeking to imitate the practices of those who worship the God, and God without a capital G, of this wicked and finite, finite world. Yet, as sinful creatures, finite and dependent human beings, you and I need a champion. We all need a leader and a king that we can trust and rely on, a leader that can liberate us from this sinful life and this sinful world. The Apostle Paul in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 to 16, introduces us to the champion, the leader, and the king we should choose and embrace. Here's what the Apostle Paul says, Hebrews 2, verses 14 to 16. Inasmuch as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death it might destroy him who had the power of death, that, that is the devil. Verse 15, and release, release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subjects to bondage. For indeed, he, Christ, does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to, see, to the seed of Abraham. In this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is urging you and I to choose Jesus. Here Paul describes Jesus as the champion of the weak and the sinful human being, like me. He is the conqueror. He is the victorious. He is the savior. In these verses, we see our divine, uh, our divine creator God, Jesus Christ, take our human nature, and mysteriously blending the two natures, the divine nature and the human nature, in one, so that he may also experience and become a human being like you and I. 
we see at Golgotha and on that terrible cross, Jesus facing and defeating the devil in a solo combat to deliver us from the bondage, the bondage of sin and death. See, when Jesus died on that cross, Satan, the enemy, appeared to have been victorious. For it seemed that even the Son of God had become subject to Satan's power of death. But God had another purpose. At the cross and through Christ's death and subsequent resurrection, Satan's power over death was terminated. It was broken. It was destroyed. Even though natural death still reigns today, the resurrection is assured. The enemy, and we're talking about Satan, the originator of sin and the author of death, will himself be annihilated forever and ever. See, in Mark chapter 3, verses 27, Mark 3, 27 tells us that no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first finds the strong man and then he will uh, 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 that he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Christ was the one who entered the strong man's house, bound the enemy, Satan, and took away his prisoners. Christ entered the, the realm of death, Satan's stronghold. He rested from, and he rested from Satan his prey. When Satan thought that he had Christ in his power, when the tomb was sealed with Christ in it, Satan exalted. But Christ burst the bonds of death and walked forth from the grave. Because, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verses 24, it was not possible that Christ should be held by it. Not only did Christ himself rise, but as Matthew tells us in Matthew 27, verses 52 and 53, and the graves were open, and many, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, after Jesus Christ's resurrection, this multitude, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. What a testimony of Christ's victory. God tells us in Isaiah chapter 42, verses 13, The Lord shall go forth like a mighty man. He shall stir up his zeal like a man of war. He shall cry out, yes, shout aloud. He shall prevail his enemies. What a champion. God is ready to save you and I. God is ready to save Israel in a solo combat. Note what he says in Isaiah chapter 49, verses 25. For there says the Lord, even the captives of, of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant be rescued. For I will contend with those who contend with you, and I will save your children. That's the type of champion that I want to have in my life. As Christians, and you and I claim to be Christians, we often think that we are engaged in a solo combat with the devil. When we read Ephesians chapter 6, we see that we are in combat with the devil. But we also see that our God, our Lord and Savior is our champion. You see, he goes, and we're talking about Jesus Christ. He goes to battle before, before, before we do. We are part of his army. That is why God tells us to use and wear His armor. We also see that we do not fight alone. The Godhead and the angels are fighting with us. Amen. As a people of God, as members of God's church, we must put on the armor of God every day and fight together behind our champion who himself is our God and our Savior. Lisa, our king is also a high priest. Yes. Please explain this function. I, I will, and he could not be a full champion unless he was a high priest. Amen. Okay. 
<clears throat> the promise that God gave to David regarding the coming Messiah announced that he would be the ruler of all God's enemies and be a high priest to his people. We can read about that in Psalms 110 verses 1, 2, and 4, which says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion. Rule in the midst of your enemies. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. We know from Genesis 14 that Abram, before his name was changed to Abraham, paid tithe to Melchizedek, who was a king and priest, a type of the Christ to come. The priests held a crucial role in the ancient Jewish sanctuary service and in the Jewish nation. Appointed by God, the priesthood was to be confined to the household of Aaron and was not to be transferred to any other family in the tribe of Levi. You can read about that in Genesis 28 and 29. The priest's function was to officiate in the sanctuary, teach God's statutes and laws, mediate in the people's relationship with God, provide counsel and judgment. It was through the priests that the people were to get a glimpse of the kingdom of God. Let's look at a few verses that describe the role of the priests. In Leviticus 1, 1 through 9, we read about that the priests officiated the offerings to ensure that they were done exactly as God commanded. After the animal offering had been killed by the person who brought it, the priests sprinkled the blood they skinned, divided, and washed the offering. They laid the wood on the altar, and they brought the fire to light the offering. In Leviticus 10, 8 to 11, it says that they were to be sober with a holy conduct so that they could discern holy from unholy and clean from unclean. In Malachi 2, verse 7, the priests were said to, they were a messenger of God to the people, and they were to have a sound knowledge of God's law to instruct the people. And in Numbers 6, verses 22 to 26, we, we find that the priests were to pronounce a blessing on God's people. And in Hebrews 5, 1 to 4, it speaks of the high priest specifically saying, For every high priest taken from among men, is appointed for men in all things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifice for sins. He can have compassion on those who are ignorant and going astray, since he himself is also subject to weakness. Because of this, he is required as for the people, so also for himself, to offer sacrifices for sins." And no man takes this honor to himself, but he who is called by God, just as Aaron was. The high priest was the head of the priests and served in a special capacity, set apart from the rest of the priesthood according to the requirements established by God. And you can read through the detail of that in Exodus 28, Leviticus 16. It was the high priest who officiated the annual Day of Atonement ceremony in the most holy place. Paul refers to this function of the high priest in Hebrews 9.25, which says, You, Lord, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will grow old like a garment, like the cloak you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. Not that he should offer himself often as the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. The high priest also wore distinct clothing, including special holy garments worn during the Day of Atonement ceremony. The high priest's clothing included a blue sleeveless robe, an embroidered tunic fringed with small bells of gold alternating with pomegranates of blue, purple, and scarlet, the ephod embroidered with blue, purple, scarlet, and gold was placed over the tunic. An onyx stone was placed on each of the shoulders of the 
of the ephod with the inscription of the 12 tribes of Israel. The breastplate which hung over the ephod contained 12 precious stones, each with one of the 12 tribes inscribed. The pocket of the breastplate contained the ermine and thuman, carried over the heart of the high priest and used by God to give direction to the children of Israel. A fine linen turban with a golden plate covered his head on which was engraved holiness to the Lord. These details of the high priest and his function pointed forward to Christ and the work he does on behalf of his people as their high priest. The colors embroidered on the priest's clothing signified, signified royalty, which was the purple, uh, king or kingdom, which is the gold, laws and commandments, or God's truth, which is the blue, and sacrifice, which is the red. Amen. Hebrews discusses how Jesus fulfilled all the requirements of the high priest and the promise given to David that the coming Messiah would be a king and a priest of his people forever. In Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18, we find that Jesus is a high priest who is merciful, faithful, and understanding of our struggle with temptation and able to give us the power to overcome sin. In Hebrews 4, 15 and 16, we find that Jesus sympathizes with our weakness. He was tempted in all points like we are yet without sin. He invites us to come boldly before him to obtain mercy and find grace. In Hebrews 8, 1 and 2, we find that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father in heaven, ministering on our behalf as the high priest. He is the minister of the heavenly sanctuary, God's true tabernacle. In Hebrews 9, 24 to 28, we learn that Jesus is our sin bearer, he put away sin by the sacrifice of himself once and for all. In Hebrews 6.20, we learn that Jesus is our forerunner who is able to save us completely. He is our hope. And in Hebrews 6.19 and 20, it reads, This hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. For those of us living in the last days, what function are we given related to the priesthood? Well, let's take a look at 1 Peter 2.9. And that says, But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Just as the ancient priests were to live a holy life we, um, and point people to God and teach his commandments and truth, we are to do the same. We, God's people, have been given the honor of serving God's royal priesthood on earth. So why don't I hand off to you, Barb, for Thursday's lesson? Okay. We're, Thursday's lesson is Je Jesus Mediates a Better Covenant. And so we're going to look at the new covenant, and we're going to look at some of the reasons why it's a better covenant. When we look at, especially at Hebrews 8 through 10, it focuses on Jesus as a mediator of this new covenant. The issues of the old covenant was simply that it was only a foreshadowing of what was to come. And so um, it wasn't, um, Christ hadn't come yet and fulfilled his promise. So it was teaching the, the nation how to prepare for Jesus. Thus the priest prefigured Jesus, but they were mortal sinners. So the, they had priests, they had men and they were sinners. They couldn't provide the perfection that Jesus does. Mm -hmm. They ministered in the sanctuary, and what they were doing was a copy or a shadow of everything that was in heaven. So in Hebrews 8, 5, we see that it says, who serve 
the copy and shadow of the things as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make a tabernacle. For he said, see that you make things according to the pattern which you saw in the mountain. So everything that was made within the temple was a pattern of what was in heaven. And if we look at the implements, we especially look at the way that, that, the, that the service was set up. We look at the, um, the instruments that were in the temple. We look at the festivals. Everything was either a part of the plan of salvation or pointed to Christ characteristically. The candlesticks, for example, they were the light of the world. Christ is the light of the world. We see the table of showbread, which is, um, we don't live by bread alone, do we? But by everything that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The altar of incense, that mediation, our prayers going up to God. So we see everything in the Old Testament having a foreshadowing of the work that Christ is doing now in our, in our, for us in our lives and in the sanctuary above. The sacrifices of animals prefigured the death of Jesus as a sacrifice in our behalf, but their blood could not cleanse the conscience. Jesus' blood, however, purifies the conscience, and through him, having faith in him and accepting his mediatory work in our behalf, we can approach the throne of God with boldness. So let's look at Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us, through the veil that is his flesh, having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with the true heart in, a, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed pure. And so we see that here Christ, a high priest, he can enter that veil. The, 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 if you remember in the, in the Old Testament, the priest could only go in once a year. But this is now Christ's, Christ's throne. Daily. Daily. He, can, he can go in, to, in, in for us. And Hebrews 8, 8 through 12, we see that God promised to us in the new covenant being because finding fault with them he says behold the days are coming says the lord when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and with the house of judah not according to the covenant that i made with their fathers in the day when i took them by the hand and led them out of egypt because they did not continue my covenant i disregarded them says the lord for this is the covenant that i have made with the house of israel after those days says the lord I will put my laws in their mind. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be our peop my people. And so God looks at us individually and collectively now, where before it was more just about the, the children, a specific group of people. But now it's all people in the world who come to Christ. Verse 11 says, None of them shall teach his neighbor nor his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for ye shall know me from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to the unrighteous and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. By appointing Jesus to our high priest, the Father inaugurated a new covenant that will accomplish what the old covenant could only anticipate. The new covenant delivers not only a perfect, eternal human divine priest can. This high priest not only explains the law of God, but also implants the law in our hearts. And that is so key. It's, it's, it, 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 it's an inner part of us. It lives there, whether we realize it or not. This priest offers a sacrifice that brings forgiveness. This priest cleanses and transforms us. He transforms that heart, that stony heart of flesh, and makes us pliable. In Ezekiel 36, 26, it says, He really creates us anew. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you. I will take that heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. In 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, 
Therefore, if anyone in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away and all things becomes new. The priest blesses us in the most incredible way by providing us access to the very presence of the Father himself. I want to read to you um, from uh, Ellen White. Uh, I think this is in your, your lesson as well. Christ was the foundation and life of the temple. Its services were typical of the sacrifice of the Son of God. The priesthood was established to represent the meditorial work of, of Christ. The entire plan of sacrificial worship was foreshadowing of the Savior's death to redeem the world. There would be no efficacy in these offerings when the great event toward which had been pointed for ages was consummated. So it's truly what God did for us with his death and now his work in the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Is a much better covenant. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so I just want to give my final thoughts here. When Jesus speaks of a new heart, he means the mind, the whole life, the life, the whole being. To have a change of heart is to withdraw the affections from the world. Mm -hmm. So we just, we leave. We leave all those desires for the world behind and to fasten them upon him. Mm -hmm. To have a new heart is to have a new mind, a new purpose, new motives. So what is the sign of a new heart? It's a changed life. Amen. There is a daily, hourly dying to self and pride. Amen. And I, I just wanted to point out here, it says hourly. Sometimes it even needs to be more frequent than that exactly. in my life. But uh, she says hourly. Then a spirit of kindness will be manifest, not by fits and starts, but continually. Mm -hmm. There will be a decided change in attitude, in deportment, in words, in actions, towards all whom you are in a way connected. You will not magnify their infirmities. You will not place them in an unfavorable light. You will work in Christ's lines. God's power alone can change a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Barbara. It's, mm. it, it is an amazing thing, isn't it? That he is mm. God, creator, God the universe. Mm -hmm. The high priest, with all its power gives us a better covenant so that in a sense we could be called a royal priest word with him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What an amazing what thing. What an amazing thing. Absolutely. Elisa, any final thoughts? Yeah, um, on similar lines, you know, I was just thinking you know, our salvation and the work that Jesus does to cleanse us and sanctify us, it, it's really one of God's great mysteries and um but yet we we are given sufficient knowledge in his word that no one needs to go astray and it, it reminds me of hebrews 2 1 through 3 which says therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard lest we drift away for if the words spoken through angels prove steadfast and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward how shall we escape if we neglect such a great salvation, yeah. which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us by those who heard him? Amen. Thank you so much, Elisa. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Elisa. Really appreciate the way you've explained this lesson. It is really terrific. Well, I've got some final thoughts for you, and I include myself in that. You know, the Apostle Paul wrote Hebrews to strengthen your faith and my faith. He reminds you and I, reminds us, that the promises of God will be fulfilled through Jesus, who is seated at the right end of the Father and who will soon take us home. Ellen G. White in Testimonies for the Church, volume, vo volume 8, pages 206 and 207, makes the following appeal. And this is appeal that I want to make, not only for my heart, but for your heart. Those only who realize that the cross 
is the center of hope for the human family can understand the gospel that Christ taught. He came to this world for no other purpose than to place men, and she's really referring to all human beings, on vintage ground before the world and the heavenly universe. Mm. He came to bear testimony that fallen human beings, through faith in his power and efficacy in the Son of God, may become partakers of the divine nature. Mm. He alone could make atonement for sinners and open the gates of paradise to the fallen race. He took on himself not the nature of angels, but the nature of man, your nature and my nature, seamless, in this world, lived the life of a tamed and tamed by sin. John, the Apostle John, in chapter 1, verses 14 and 12, makes the following observation. And the world became flesh and dwelt among us. And the Word, not the world, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believed in his name. Amen. Jesus is mediating the Father's blessings to you and to me, just as we speak here this morning. Let's hold fast to our faith until the very end. Jesus is the answer. Jesus is the way. Jesus has won the battle. And he helps you and I every day to win our battles with the devil. By faith, and through faith. Let us commit our lives to the, to the Lord. Remember, when we believe in Jesus and we give our lives to Jesus, we are called and we become a royal priesthood for our Lord and Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Mm. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you so much for your amazing grace. How wonderful it is to be able to read what the Holy Spirit inspired Paul and those that wrote for him and edit the epistle of Hebrews. Father, we have an opportunity to learn about you, to get to know you better, to understand your love. Lord, the height and the depth, the width and the breadth of your love for each one of us. And I want to thank you, Father, for this grace that you made available, available to us, that gives us an opportunity to look forward, to live with you in the new Jerusalem, to cross Jordan into the new Jerusalem and be with you perpetually together as heirs of the kingdom, sitting at your right side, at your left side, as you govern the new earth with us. Oh, I'm looking forward to that, Lord. I know that I'm a sinner. But Lord, my hope is in you. And Father, give us all the ability not only to love you, but to love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, and with all our power. And give us that faith to walk with you every day. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Happy Sabbath, Have everybody. Have a happy, happy Sabbath. Sabbath.